Good morning. <clears throat> this is our Wednesday morning at nine o'clock as the day begins. Uh, and we're having our little guitar chat. I hope everybody's doing good. Uh, grab your cup of joe here. Just happen to have one from my uh, Nespresso maker. Tom Johnson, what's happening? PA. Philadelphia, PA. Santa Cruz and Sun. And Andrew, good morning. Gerhard from Norway. Salute. How is that guitar working out for you, that 550? Ooh, that was a nice guitar. You've talked about that strap before. Can you refresh my memory working on converting to your posture? Yeah. Um, okay, so this strap, you can get them from L. L and M. Uh, didn't that used to be a pack of cigarettes? L and M. Uh, anyway, uh, L and M, and it's a base strap. I just ordered another one. I've had this one. I was thinking probably easy twenty years. Hold on, hold on. And uh, so I just ordered another one because the holes in in mine are really getting all stretched out. But uh, it was $42. And uh, basically, we're talking about when you hold a jazz guitar. You hold it like this across your body here. Boom, 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 like this. Neck up. This does not support it. Don't be playing like this. That's how I used to play it. It's not good. Now, if you got a good strap, you're not going to, your shoulder. Now, I don't know which shoulder is bothering you, but it used to be this shoulder for me. By playing like this and so but now it's all hunky-dory okay let's see so uh, check that out that's a great little strap and um, it's uh, if you read the description about it they, they talk about how it's been a uh, yeah there it is right there wow way to go Wes and uh, look at that padding and it's adjustable. The only problem with the strap, it's got these little rivets uh, that hold the strap on there. Uh, you see those little rivets? Well, they're under the, the L and M there. And they unscrew, so I had to glue them in. So, okay. Uh, 
Lanny Hargrove, good morning from Crossville, Tennessee. Um, Andre from Belgium. Wow, no kidding. Wow, that is amazing to go all over the world. Wow, what a crazy world we live in. The heritage guitar is working out very good. Love it. That was a real sweet heritage, man. That's that's great. Gephard, Gerhard, of which I had the hardest time pronouncing his name, came to our workshop uh, last time we had it. And uh, him and his family stayed a while, and they, they came and heard me play. And then I had this 550 for sale, and he bought it and took it home. So anyway, um, it was nice to meet his family, all from Norway. Well, of course. Anyway, it's really cool. Okay, Raph, Ralphie Valadares Stanfield. What's happening, Ralphie? Yes. What does yes mean? You know, Tony Robbins says the key to getting anything done and really being successful is just keep saying yes. Say yes to yourself all the time. Yes. Yes. When you go to play this lick, which I always screw up, like that. If I say yes, it comes out better. See? Now if I said no, no. See? That doesn't work. Yes. So keep saying yes to yourself. Well, that, that sounds like a book title. Kim, good morning from BC. Pleased to be here to listen and learn. Well, I'm really pleased to have you. And Brad, Brad, how are you? Brad from Palm Springs. Gail and I were just saying we're going to be in Palm Springs um, for Mother's Day that week end, and I don't know, we could come sooner. And so, Brad, you got any gigs there? <clears throat> I've talked to a few people. Tim, the drummer that played with John Pisano, about doing um, something at a golf pro shop or something. Yes, L&M cigarettes. So anyway, I'd like to go to Palm Springs and, and, and kind of make a little uh, gig trip out of it too, and then you can write everything off. Hey, sweet. Okay, so... Um, this week in the guitar news. Wes, could you hit that heater there? Uh, well, first off, I want to thank uh, Wes and Gail for, for doing this with me. That's really... Oh, okay, Larry, it's LM Products. There's Wes. And Gail's uh, up there writing all those things that say, hi, you know, that have my name on the comments there. Um, hey, that tip jar thing has been working out really well. And thank you guys for Wes. Uh, give them a little gas money. I appreciate that. Um, so anyway, I think Tim plays with Doug at a at Jay's on the green, which is on a golf course. Yes, that's that's what I'm talking about. Um, that would be nice to do. That would be really nice to do. Uh, I know there's wonderful players there in Palm Springs. Good grief. So I played a gig this week, uh, last uh, last Sunday. It was really cool. I mean, but I discovered something. It's very hard to play with a mask on be for me because I'm always going like this. And... If I do that, there's a mask there, and then and I, I got a whole mask stuffed in my mouth, and it just doesn't work. Or I put it in, you know, you can't get it's, it's very annoying. So, ah, uh, where's the green? It's Saint Patrick's Day, yes, and it's Saint Paddy's Day, P A D D Y S, apostrophe S, not P A T T Y S, as we were reprimanded by an Irishman to clue us in on what it really is. So, okay, it's St. Patty's Day. Welcome, you guys. Let's play Danny Boy, shall we? 
Why not? Can you hear everything okay? Good. Well, hey, thank you. Uh, St. Patty's Day. What, what a great song that is, isn't it? Just a, just a wonderful song. Hey, which ending do you like better? Do you like this better? Listen. Then we got this little run here. How about this one? Do you like that ending better? Or do you like the this? Something like that? Do you like that better? Vote on your ending. Ending one and ending two. Okay, there is our lesson on Danny Boy. You should really have that. There's two versions of it. There's a simple, well, none of it's simple. Uh, there's a simpler version and an advanced version. Okay, where are we at? Let's see. I used my tip coupon and bought the fishing haul, and that is really helping me with my finger style learning. Oh, that's right. When you make a donation to the tip jar, you get a coupon for five dollars and then you can use it on the uh website for a free lesson woohoo 
Yeah, Wes is good with that. Yeah, tips. It's all about tips. T and A. Tips and... Okay. Um, where are we at here? Actually, let's see. Can we please have the link to the guitar strap? Okay. Uh, I think we can probably gather that together. It's l &M Cigarettes. Liggett and Myers Tobacco Company. Also, since you mentioned golf, I was Arnold Palmer's. It was Arnold Palmer's cigarette of choice. Working on a version of Canadian Sunset this week. Arnold Palmer, huh, I didn't know he was a smoker. Huh. Well, that's good. You know, I'll tell you, I always, Gil and I both smoked for many, many years. I started when I was 15, and I quit November 15th, 1983. I remember that day because he had to sign a card. And uh, I think Gail was going to go in for this clinic, and... Uh, she got sick or something, and so I went in her place, and another, another friend of mine went, and uh, we ended up quitting. But I do enjoy a cigar from time to time. Ending two. Ending two, this one. <laughs> Ralph, love Denny Boy. Thanks, Rich. Chromatic, cool, way cool. What about using linseed oil on one's guitar? Do you mix it in solvent paint thinner? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you just use linseed oil just a tiny bit on a cotton ball, just not on your guitar, just on the fretboard. When it's dry, you do it like once every six months. That's all. Yeah, don't be mixing anything else in there. Uh, I could tell you some cool things to mix in there that really might screw up your guitar. Yeah, maybe some CBD oil or whatever. Put that in there. Get <laughs> yeah, big whiff of linseed oil. All right, the strap is made by LM Products and is available at Sweetwater Sound in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Thank you, Larry. Okay, Arnold quit in the 70s. Okay. Is anyone else's transmission breaking up? Um, Max B, transmission. What? Oh, transmission, you mean on your car or? Oh, oh Wes, wait a minute. I think, did I forget to put this on the, uh, hold on a second. Hold on here. How do I do this? I got to, uh, I got to get in here and check this, make sure that this is on the hardwired dealy bob. Yes, it is. Okay, well. Okay, we're good. We're good. Okay, we're we're styling. Okay, Levi straps are good too. All right, so let's. Uh, Wes, did you could you get up uh, and get ready for reverb? Uh, there's a guitar that I want to talk about. It's called a vintage 1963 Gibson ES175. So get that ready. Uh, let's look at our chord corner. Here we are. This is our chord corner. And for those of you reading along in today's hymnal, we're in uh, number six on the chord licks, which I hope you have downloaded at one time or another in your life. The video is fine in Norway. Do they have Chevys in Norway or is it just fjords? <laughs> Yeah, I just, yeah, it's, all right, number six. Number six looks like this. It's going from a C chord to an F chord. Does that ever happen? C dominant to an F major? Ah, I guess sometimes. So it, here's what it sounds like.
So if we were to go close close up, it'd be. And now, so I've, I've got here, this is a C9, and then I'm raising this note, so it's a C11. Then we're gonna take it chromatically up, and I switch these two fingers, which sometimes is very hard for me to do. So then I just play a flat five here. So that's what I like to play, but when I could play it, I did this. And then a, a E diminished, which is a C7 flat nine, and then to a G minor nine, and then a C7 flat five, F sharp nine, F sharp 13, F major seven. Oh yeah, you could do it like this too. So you got like a D, kind of a D over C. So like we're, let's say we're taking a song like, um, ending something like that makes sense got this chromatic sound okay all within a C chord ta-da so that, that, again, you have chromatic sounds going through chord changes, and that's where you get all these weird chords, right? That's where they came from, is chromatic notes, uh, melodies going through chords, and then later on, there's the guys, well, hey, that, that chord is this, a flat five with a nine. Uh, C, C9 flat five, so. Okay. So where are we at here? Uh, anyone else's transmission breaking up? Well, I had a problem and I took it into the shop and uh, they adjusted the bands. There's a pun in there somewhere. Okay, here we go. Yo, Brad, good luck on Rich's version of Fish and Hole. Brought it, brought it, bought it a few years ago and find it tough. My hands look, starting to look like riches. Well, maybe I shouldn't have done that fishing hole. It's a great version, though. Thank you. So, uh, um, you know, just learn it. And I'll tell you what. Okay, so I got arthritis. I got kind of, I have rheumatoid. I've, been, I've had rheumatoid since I was 40. So what's it been, about 10 years? And... Um, 20, uh, 30 years. So uh, what What the, uh, and then I, you got osteo, which is just the wearing out of joints. But I'll tell you what, my hands feel pretty darn good, okay? And considering, and you keep them moving, you gotta keep them moving. Now my feet, if I could play like, like the accordion or something with my feet, then they wouldn't look so bad. They're, you don't want to see those. Okay, they're going every which way. You know, so toes on top of toes. And I don't want to get graphic on there. But so, but if those, if I could keep my toes moving a long time ago, they wouldn't be so bad. That's my opinion. Also, cold water, hot water. Cold water, hot water, two or th three, four times a week. Um, hello from Wisconsin. Thanks for doing this chat. What brand of strings are you using? 
Uh, these are Dia Dario Chrome Brights, flat wounds, extra light, but they come with a 10 and a 14. I take those and throw them away and I buy a separate 13 and a 15. So it's heavy, heavy two top strings, light low strings. That I feel is the most balanced sound and uh, it's the easiest on your hands. Um, let's see, where else are we? Live stream quality improved dramatically. Good. Could you show some dominant shapes that can easily be moved in thirds or tritones? I don't know. Didn't you just answer your own question there? Could I show? Here's a dominant seven. Look at, um, let's, let's do, um, let's do this dominant seven just up here. Right. So I, I don't have the root. Um, oh, yeah, I do. It's up here. So, so it, it, F moves to G. B moves to D. D moves to F. That moves to B. That's how you figure out a dom your inversion. Next inversion. G moves to B, D moves to F, F moves to G, B moves to D. So now I have next inversion, B moves to D, F moves to G, G moves to B, D moves to F. Now that's within this four string group. And it starts all over. Ah, I can't reach it. Anyway, that's, I have a lesson. Uh, honey, maybe you could show them where that lesson is on dominant seventh inversions. Uh, I got a ton of those and it explains how to do them. And then, yes, they all intertwine uh, because now here's a G7. G7 moves to C7, so my C7 would be there. Here's G7 moving to D7. Here's G7 moving to C7. G7 moving to D7. G7 move to C7. G7 moving to C7. Okay, all right, so, okay, so where are we at, sir? I have a beautiful Guild X500 from the 19, 1976. The condition is amazing, and I want to, to stay that way. Do you have some advice on preserving the gold on the tailpiece and pick up some advice? Beeswax? Hey, none of your beeswax, man. <laughs> what are we in, third grade? I am still in third grade. All right, so look at what I would do is um, I wouldn't use too many cleaners on the gold. Just it, just wipe it down. Um, you can use a very, very mild wax on the gold. If you get too much, uh, if you get uh, a wax that's real aggressive, then uh, it'll take that gold right off. So just keep it, try to keep it dry. You know, your, your guitar is a, a really a mix because you need some humidity for the wood, but the, you don't need it for the metal, right? So it's like, yikes, how do you do that? So um, so some things just, so just try to keep it dry. Keep your guitar humidified, but take it out every once in a while and wipe off those. You know, it, it doesn't hurt to do a deep clean too. Um, I don't do this too often, but you take off the tuners and you take off the tailpiece and you really just clean it. Now, the pickup covers can all be replaced, but um, 
get it clean, make sure it's clean and free of oil and all that. You tap it smooth as Joe pass. Thank you. Okay, where are we at here, Wes? Let's, let's go over to, okay, let's go, let's go to Reverb.com. Wes, did you find that guitar? Uh, I don't know. Is it this one? Yes. <clears throat> All right, so I've looked at this guitar. It just came up, and I thought, number one, it's a good price. Um, this is a good company. You look for that. Um, but if you look at it, it's a little deceiving. Killer PAF player. All right, PAF, the sought-after guitar pickup, is a PAF. Well, the original, you got to read in here, the original has been replaced. The original pickup is worth probably half of the price of that guitar. All right, so now if you, but that's okay. I never liked the original PAFs. I thought they sucked. So uh, my friend Mitch Holder said they, they sound tight. And I think that's a good description of them. But what, now you take a look at that headstock. I don't know if you can make that picture bigger, but that headstock leaves a little to be desired, don't it? Yes, it does. So that's maybe one of the reasons it's priced uh, lower. Um, and then keep going on that headstock. You'll notice at least this company, these people seem to be fair in their price. And they also seem to be very upfront with the condition of the guitar. They show everything. Now notice the tuners have been replaced. Okay. So, you know, whatever. When you take, now the neck isn't too bad. It's got some dings and stuff like that. So I look for that because all that, gets annoying. Uh, so you got to make sure that, you know, it can be kind of fixed and it wouldn't, I would, on a guitar like this, okay, the pickup's been removed. So that's one of the reasons it's not original. Uh, if I refinish the neck, it wouldn't bother me. So keep going out there, Wes. Um, uh, go down a little further to, to take a look at the fretboard. So I look at the fretboard and you take a look at, we're talking about, notice how the, the inlays, um, you know, it's kind of funky there, right? So that tells me that the fretboard kind of has uh, shrunk a little bit. Something, something's going on there a little bit. But is it detrimental to the guitar? Heck no, you know. Um, so it's kind of weird what's going on with those inlays and, and the, the thing, but we're being very picky here. So this is an example of a rosewood fretboard that needs a little linseed oil. And, uh, that, that would make that, that look a little better. The frets, you take a look at the frets, you see how they're kind of, they're not shiny. That tells me the guitar really hasn't been played a whole lot because, Generally, you would kind of take care of it and get rid of the corrosion on that, you know. So that's an easy fix to get that taken off. Not a problem. Uh, so I think this is a fair buy for this guitar if you're so inclined to want a, a 175. Um, but it's a good-looking guitar. It's a 63 and, uh, you know, what the heck? So that's, you know, that's kind of what I look at. I look at that and I think, well, you never know what you're going to get. But I think this company is probably pretty good. Um, I've seen many things that they've had and they're a reputable company. I don't know why we did that, but I, that's, that's a guitar that I have in my watch list. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to get it. And I'll tell you why. I know I'm not a big fan of 175s, period, you know. So 
the pickup is in the wrong damn place. Okay, they back the pickup down, so it's a little trebly, trebly er. But you know what I've got coming in? <laughs> I've got a golden eagle, with just kind of like this, but it's newer, a lot newer. Um, I also have a super eagle coming in. <laughs> and a, a super eagle is 18 inches. So you talk about writing a guitar. It's big, and I can't wait to get that. So I'm excited about that. I sold a, uh, a, a Golden Eagle this week. I am in my Howard Roberts, the red one, the Gibson, and sold those. <clears throat> Anybody get their stimulus money? You know, so that's where it's all going. <laughs> so, um, what? Super Eagle? Uh, well, that's got PAFs. No. No, it's not on there. It was from a guy up in Seattle. Um, that's got a that that eagle has got different things on it, different pickups. Okay. Um, let's see. Since you're talking about chords, I recently got a copy of your friend's. Oh, chord uh, chord catastrophe. That's what he ended up calling it. By the way. I know this is not an easy question, but how do I handle some of those crazy voicings? You've got to pick and choose which ones you want. That's the key, okay? You're not going to be able to do them all. Ted couldn't do them all, okay? So he's showing you the possibilities. So uh, find the ones that fit you and use them, okay? Like Joe Pass uh, said to Tim, hey, that's a nice, uh, that's a nice chord, but how fast can you get to it? So pick and choose the ones you like, ones, you know, that really appeal to you and use them. Some of the things I think were some of the most valuable things. Um, and I have lessons on this. It's uh, A minor seven equals F sharp, my, excuse me, A six equals F sharp minor seven. And that is a wonderful, wonderful uh, resource. And then it's also got F, then I have one called um, like uh, uh, E9 equals uh, C sharp, uh, E9, no, E9 equals uh, G sharp minor seven, flat five, or B minor six. All those in how to take a minor chord and turn it into a dominant. So I don't know, Gail, if you could find some of those links on there, that would be great. Uh, thanks for the lesson on versions, but I meant meant something else. In another stream, you took uh, the Hendrix voicing and moved it in thirds. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, generally you can take. As a rule of thumb, based off a dominant theory that, or excuse me, the diminished theory of taking a chord and all of these, like for instance, is an A, uh, excuse me, a, the mouth is, is working faster than the brain. This is a G7 flat nine, right? All of those. So basically I can take any of these kind of inversions and they kind of have a similar effect. So um, uh, that's about it. So that G moving to C, right? Ah, whatever. So you have to let your ear do, do the judge of that. Rich, I just finished writing out a chord melody for When You Wish Upon a Star. I'd like to email it to you. I'd like your thoughts on it. Okay. Be happy to look at it. Maybe I can steal some stuff. You you run the risk, you know. You know, if you if you steal from one person, it's stealing. If you steal from three, it's research. If you steal from ten, it's inspiration. 
So I don't think anybody, uh, everybody has something to offer. You'd be amazed at what I've learned from just some of my students. Uh, so anyway, if you had to pick one solid wood vintage arch top with a floating pickup or with a floating pickup or laminate with a P90 or a humper, which if you had to pick one solid wood arch top with a floating pickup or a laminate with a P90, oh, which would I take? Floating solid wood. Okay, mineral spirits on a Q-tip. Mineral, what's that for? Um, how do Heritage 18-inch compare with something like Super 400? It's just like it. It's like a Super 400. I had a Super 400 once, and it's not as big as what you think it is, but it's really kind of fun. It's just have that big thing. It doesn't fit, but actually it did fit in an overhead. I took it to Dallas once, and it did fit in an overhead uh, case. And uh, I always liked that guitar, but that particular one did not sound as nice as I thought it would. I don't know. I maybe. I mean, I tried a couple different pickups on it and stuff. As Ted said, demolished equals egads. <laughs> okay. So I like I like Super Four Hundreds. Let's see. Let's play a song, Wes. It says here, let's play a song. Wes, did you get the rundown on this? Yep. Okay. So here's a song. Uh, this is She's Leaving Home by the Beatles. An old show. Yeah. Close enough for jazz, right? That's what we always used to say.
Isn't that a pretty song? Good grief. I remember the first time I heard that song. It's like, holy cow, geez, what a, that is so nice. Gives me goosebumps. What a beautiful tune. You know, those guys kind of knew what they were doing. You look at that chord progression and you think, holy crap. Okay. Um, are you using Finale or uh, no, Sibelius? Please say something about your airplane travel with a guitar. Well, I did, uh, I would always do a carry on, it just in a gig bag. And most of the time, they'll let you carry it on, or you have to gate check it, and which means that they will take care of it and put it at the top of the uh, pile. But I, a lot of times, they'll let you put it in a coat closet, so it's always risky. Um, so I don't know what to tell you, because one time I had two brand new Hofner Jazzicas, and Gail and I took them to Dallas, I think. Or no, we picked them up. I don't remember. Anyway, going there, it was fine. They did exactly that. Uh, we let them carry it, carry it on. It was no, no big deal. Coming home, the guy was just a real butthead. Nope, nope, you can't, nope, you can't do a gate check either. You got to put them in a luggage. I said, you're kidding. And it's a flimsy gig bag in a, and uh, yeah, and yeah, arch solid top, arch top guitar. And they're like, oh crap, well, get a good look at it because it ain't going to make it. So, uh, but we believe it or not, it, it made it. So thank you, Jesus. But anyway, so it's always a, it's always a, uh, it's always a, I, I would always try to go on with with it, carry it on, and, and they'll store it up for you. Sometimes they've given it a seat, empty seat. It's really worked out good. Okay, do you listen to any contemporary younger jazz guitar players like uh, Kurt? I've heard Kurt. I I don't I don't listen to them uh, on a regular basis. I should. I, you know, when I listen to, I listen to well, the old, I don't do that much listening of jazz guitar now that I think about it. I just, um, I don't know. My favorite is Jody Ario as far as anybody contemporary, and he's old, <laughs> but I, I like Jody Ario. Uh, Joe went places where no man has gone before, and um, so... I could tell you a lot of stories about Joe. Uh, Rich Beetle, make a solo Beetle covers album. I should, yes. Thank you. I appreciate it, Ralph. One is legally now able to carry a guitar on a plane. Good. Good. Why is it that most people don't enjoy jazz? I don't enjoy it. Didn't enjoy it until fairly recently, and I learned about theory. I think that's the thing is uh, once we started having music education um, in the public schools, I, you know, um, you know, they're only fed, but the top 40, you know what I mean? And, and that's about making money. <laughs> so uh, studying uh, an art form is a little different. So that's called, you know, the difference between art and commerce uh, doesn't mean they don't interlap, but basically it's the way it is. But uh, I, I think it's because of the there's no education in music in school. In Europe, jazz is much bigger, and I think it's because they have music education, if I'm if correct in saying that, but I believe it's true. All right, I want to show you a video. Um, you know, we're going to, it looks like our camp is really going to happen. Uh, uh, we've gotten, I've talked to the camp and our, um, the, um, they're basically a church facility. And so they have a little different uh, things. 
uh, protocols. And so it looks like it's going to be able to, to happen. And, uh, so I've been holding off getting a guest instructor yet because I still got to make sure about this. Okay. They're going to call me today, not the guest, the camp, but, um, I want to, uh, show you this because this is with, uh, Mike Dana, who is a regular at the camp. And of course we have Todd Johnson. I don't have a video. Todd isn't on this one, but it's me and Mike Dana, uh, doing a, a jazz thing for this TV thing. And uh, the volume might be a little low on this, so you better probably have to crank it up. But we're doing Green Dolphin Street, but Mike will be there. Mike's a superb educator, but he's also a superb teacher and arranger. Mike's the kind of guy is like, hey, Mike, would you, uh, could you write a big band arrangement to my song? Yeah. Uh, hey, Mike, could you do a string quartet uh, to this song? Yeah. Hey, Mike, could you do a... Uh, an opera, a choir piece. Yeah, I could do that. You know, so <laughs> he's really knowledgeable. So I learn a lot from hanging with him. So anyway, here's Mike Dana and uh, myself and a wonderful drummer who has passed away, Brian Homada, and my old pal, uh, Roy Carlson on bass. So I hope you enjoy it. We're doing Green Dolphin Street. Hey, why don't we play a little Green Dolphin Street? All right. Thank you. 
Well, there it is. Uh, hope you enjoyed that. Um, that's a, such a fun tune, man. That that uh, that's such a cool, cool tune. Um, uh, where are we at here? At one, everyone played an instrument in elementary school. First, third, yes. Do you still do the Guitar College? Yes, I do. Yes, GuitarCollege.net, and then there's. 99 cent guitar lessons. I would like to get some of that material. Good. Hi, Eddie Davis. What's happening, man? So Eddie just, he's been working through, uh, oh no, Eddie just sent me uh, him playing this. Midnight Blue. And uh, that's one of our tunes that's going to be in the camp. It's also one of the tunes in the jazz guitar improv uh oh no it's not never mind it's one of the ones on the can okay go roy play on gary yeah gary wasn't in there i think a lot of people don't enjoy jazz because they just don't hear it they want a simple beat and lyrics that well yeah it's because yeah bingo um <clears throat> That's why they don't enjoy symphonic music. Okay, it's too hard to understand, you know. So, um, you know, it's that's why Dr. Seuss books are, which, of course, you know, Dr. Seuss, he, he got in trouble, right? Cancel Dr. Seuss, for God's sake, yeah. Racist. <laughs> Jeez. Um, anyway, yeah, what's going on with our world? Uh, thank you, Brad. What what did I, I read? Oh, never mind. I, I don't want to get into politics. Make my stomach. Let's do a lick. And I want to show you this lick because I, when I learned this lick, it opened up a whole new world for me. And this lick is jazz lick number one. I'd like to say that I wrote this, but I'm gonna say, I'm gonna tell you the truth and no, I did not. But when I learned this lick, it was an eye opener. All right, the lick is a two, five, one lick. Two, five, one, around key of C. And the lick goes like this. I'm starting on the note G. 
down to C sharp, up to F, then, and then to, so now I have, let me play the lick first. Brad, since you took lessons from me at GIT, we probably did this lick. Now, here is my D minor. And then it's like an A minor with a blues note. And then to a, a G7 with a flat 9. And then F to a E. Now, doesn't that sound like, where, where are these notes coming from? By the way, I have a lesson on this lick, and it's called Diagramming a Lick. Uh, now, I think that's the 12, is that the 16 jazz licks? Yes, that's that's it. But there's also another one, and it's called Diagramming a Jazz Lick, something like that. And we take this lick and explore what the heck is going on with it. Why does this lick sound so good? Well, for one thing, it's playing around. It starts off, and it's a D minor chord, but really, look at it. Those are the two principal tones from an A7. Right? A flat 7 and the 3rd. So actually, that's outlining an A7 while we're on a D minor. So, now we're into the, the critical note, that flat 3 of D minor. But now, what the heck is this? Playing a, like an A minor blues against the D minor. Right? 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 You hearing it? So it's got that element in it. And then we're coming down. And then to the flat nine. So that flat nine, right out of the harmonic minor, C minor, harmonic minor scale. I have gotten so much mileage out of that lick. You know that lick? Brad says, I know that lick. And what's great about it is that you can alter it, switch it around and do a lot of stuff with it. Bingo, bingo, that's exactly what you wanna do. So a D minor chord is present. Let's start on the A7. Back to the blues, back to the G. Absolutely. So that's why, you know, you learn the licks. They become part of your vocabulary. Can you plug them in exactly where they go in a tune? <clears throat> hey, wait a minute. That lick, Bob Conte is using that lick because I... I showed that lick at one of the camps he was there. And so he better not be using that lick. That lick came from Dan Higgins, a wonderful sax player in LA. And I played a couple gigs with Dan and I was like blown away. He's like number one sax player in LA. And this is many, many, many years ago. And then I saw him at the NAMM show and he, you know, we're talking, and he had uh, written little tiny books, and in there was that lick. I bought all of his books, and uh, so that's where I found that lick. So let's give credit where credit's due. That lick, I don't know where he got it from, but I'm hoping he made it up. Dan Higgins is his name. So that is a fantastic lick. Now, when you learn a lick, what do you do? 
you learn to play it in all the different shapes. So, okay, that would, that's the key of G. I mean, keep F, excuse me, starting in a G minor, okay? Learn to play it in all the shapes. Okay, where are we at here? Play the melody and some nice harmonics make it. They uh, make money. What? What? Gail isn't a big jazz fan. She likes melodic, lyrical jazz, but not the outside jazz. That's true. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of the outside stuff, too, all the time. So, you know, whatever. Okay, where are we at? I, uh, explain how to modulate from the key of C to the key of E or any other key. It's quite simple. You just play two five of the key you're going to. So if I'm in the key of C, and now I want to move to E, I would go, what is the two chord of E? It's F sharp minor seven five five, or F sharp. Then B seven. And then E. So here I am in C. Yeah. All right, so now if you want to be slick, is you find a chord that is a uh, common chord between the two keys, and that's called a pivot chord. And in this case, a pivot chord might be, how about an A minor? A minor is six in the key of C. It could also be <clears throat> four minor in the key of E. So let's try that. So. that kind of went together. C, Q, C. Now I played an E7 to take me to A minor. And then I went to F sharp minor 7. Now let's get back to the key of C. Okay, so you see that? So generally you look for a pivot chord that can function between the two. So let's see, is there any other chords? Yeah, you know, like, uh, you know, B minor seven flat five to B seven, that's an awkward change. That wouldn't sound so hot. Uh, B, D, no, let's see. Ah, so the A minor is a good one. Okay. You think that was a Charlie Parker lick? I believe that. You adjust the pull pieces in the humbucking. Can you please tell us about the mindset of that type of adjustment? Yeah, you know, if you have a VU meter and, uh, you know, you can take a look at it. And I like to raise the pickup a little bit on the treble side. Sometimes I raise it too much. Uh, but it, generally, if I want a little more bass, I can reach over here and turn that bass knob off. And that brings out that bass. Uh, but I like to raise sometimes the pole pieces, depending on there. If you get a VU meter somehow, you know, then you can kind of see and balance out your guitar with those with those dealy bombs. So yeah, those are made to adjust, and uh, don't worry about screwing something up. Okay, let's play a tune. Here is there will never be another you. And I'm going to try to incorporate this lick. Let's see. So, um, how does the song? Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. So, we're in E flat. Then D minor. Then the C minor. Did you hear that lick? Let's just play that. 
little bit. I'm going to use this pick. No. I can't decide. <laughs> is a little funky. That's a great tune, isn't it? Um, time for my afternoon meds and a nap. Okay, Stan. Well, thanks for joining. Sorry you got to go, but I understand the nap concept. Brad, I love There Will Never Be Another You. I call it the shepherd's lament. There will never be another you. Yes. Jamie Finley from GIT loved the joke and stole it from me at GIT. <laughs> Jamie Finley, wow, what a great guy. All right, tell you what, let's move into our technique talk. Let's get into this, okay? And what we're going to talk about today is scales with triplets. It's really important for you to really get into the triplet thing. 
triplets are basically playing three notes per beat, right? So it's one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a one. All right, so when we do that, it could be like playing just a scale like. idea now let's talk about maybe groups of three groups of three would basically be like this the first three notes of the scale second three notes So that would sound like this. Descending. So that's groups of threes going up in scale-wise motion. One, two, three. Da 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 Something like that. All right, by the way, this material was in my book here, which you can, I just realized you can find it on eBay. And Dale Zedenik is still selling this book. And that's called Las, I think, Las Vegas Music. And it's a wonderful, wonderful book. I get no residuals on it, so I ain't doing it to do that. But it's a nice book. And it's got scales and triplets and all that other stuff. And that the, um, the way it came about really is, is when I took lessons from a fellow named Tom Morello, he, uh, he um, had me reading out of clarinet books. Remember this, Gail? It went on forever. So these etudes. So um, uh, I thought, why isn't there anything like that on guitar? So that's when I put that together. But anyway, I've got three pages of scale exercises in triplets. And triplets are, are so important for the jazz uh, style. <laughs> So, yeah, you want to be able to play that uh, in a jazz style, uh, be able to play triplets. Oh, here's some other ones here. Oh, here's an interesting one. You would go up on a G scale and down on an octave. So, you know, even if you can't play it like super fast and all that stuff, it's good to keep your mind thinking about what's going on with playing something like that. It's really good for you. Okay, so scales and triplets start by just playing...
Okay, so you get used to playing in in the triplet field. And then, by the way, I want to point this out. Playing groups of three sound really hip as a straight eighth. Did you hear that? So, uh, yeah, you want to be able to play groups of threes within any scale uh, and then be able to play that triplet feel. Well, you guys, let's see. We have some questions here. I do observe why Barney Kessel said, uh, playing by modes, play what you hear in your head. Yes, play what you hear in your head, but you got to have something in your head to play, to hear. And that's the problem. The guys say that, um, and they don't have any vocabulary. Okay, so Barney uh, learned Charlie Christian legs and expanded on them, right? And so it goes back to those guys. So uh, hearing jazz players, Charlie Parker, all those guys, learning their stuff. What I've done is I've taken licks that I think and, and solos that are very melodic and cool sounding and taught them to my students and they take those licks and rearrange them. And that's what it's all about. But you, so you've got to have something in your head and in your fingers to play. Now we did this exercise one time at uh, camp. We had people sing a minor blues. And they went, and they could sing like crazy. And I say, okay, now play it. And they're like, just kidding. They couldn't play anything what they could hear. Nothing. So that's true of all, everybody. So you either got to sit down and work it out and get it in your fingers or learn some stuff like that. It, it just doesn't come automatically. Play what you hear. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a big, that's like saying, hey, the key to improv is to transcribe. Transcribe. Yes. Transcribe. Yeah. You tell that somebody who's, who's <laughs> transcribe who, who doesn't have any vocabulary, has no skill. Are you kidding? Really? Forget it. Five minutes, you know, five days of trying to transcribe five notes drive you up the wall. So anyway, that's my deal as you got to learn some solos, learn them note for note. After a while, you get, uh, you get those things in your fingers and in your head. Uh, I observe you're doing your leads on the first, second, third strings. When is it good to play leads on the fifth and sixth? Oh, I think it's really good. As a matter of fact, I didn't have nerve enough to do this when I was doing the opening song. Uh, because if you play unison with a guitar uh, or a saxophone player or something, when you play in the lower register, it sounds so much better. So instead of going... It sounds good to go. Ah, uh, so you see why it didn't? Ah. Uh. See, that sounds uh, thicker and it sounds cooler, man. So you want to learn everything in, in both registers, you know, not just a pair. Okay. That song, by the way, is called Groovin' High. Where are we at? Wolfgang's Mozart's violin studies are good. Yes. Eddie Davis. Yes, this book is available on eBay. Rich Severson, Guitar Tick. 
No, I won't play Tico Tico. Thank you, though, for asking. Happy to think. Okay, we're getting towards the end here, guys. And I want to thank you for, for coming. I'm going to play one more tune. Here's a tune called Beautiful Love. And the story is, this was played at Joe Pass's funeral, his favorite song. And uh, let's check out this. Here we go. One, go. guys thank you very much for coming
hey, we'll see you next Wednesday. Talk at you later. Thank you again for coming. Don't forget the tip jar, please. And, uh, well, adios.